<laughs> so good morning, everyone. I am Jesse Wittish with Kentucky Youth Advocates. Thank you for joining us for this Advocate Virtual Forum on St. Patrick's Day. And we are excited to hear from our panelists today. Just a reminder that we are recording this to share as both a video and podcast. So we ask that you stay muted, but if you have questions or comments, please do drop those into the chat. We know that this is a topic that folks may have some really specific questions about. Um, and if the presenters don't cover that, please do feel free. Um, we, well, we encourage you um, to add those questions in there so we make sure that those questions get answered because if you have them, someone else does too. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Terry Brooks. Hey, Jesse, thanks and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. Uh, also hope uh, everyone is busily completing their brackets for the, uh, the tournament. I know those are the, the top priorities for folks. So uh, welcome. Uh, you all know that uh, I think this is maybe our 43rd or 44th uh, weekly forum. Uh, we have embraced the idea that uh, these unprecedented times absolutely demand unprecedented attention around kids and families. And so, uh, again, you all know we have tried to cover everything from uh, talking to our federal delegation uh, about action in, Frank in uh, Washington to the uh, action going on in Frankfurt to grassroots and community level action. Uh, today, uh, we want to talk about uh, such an important topic, and I'd like you to take just, just a few seconds and literally think of five important people in your life. Not generally, I, I want you to name mentally five people who you care about a lot. And I'm going to give you a second to do that. Okay. So if you're thinking about those five people, what the latest national data tells us through the Census Bureau Pulse survey is that if, if they represented America or in Kentucky specifically, more than one of those five folks would be telling you that within the last week, they sometime or frequently did not have enough to eat. I'm gonna say that one more time. Some 22% of Kentuckians in the latest data that we have, 22% of Kentuckians do not have enough to eat on a weekly basis. I mean, there are some statistics that you know, I hate to tell you, I, I, I listen to and look at, and I have to be careful that I don't almost gloss over them. This is not one of them. Uh, that just rocks me. That just rocks me that in Kentucky, in America, forget the pandemic, in the year 2021, that we have folks who don't have enough to eat. And that's what the topic is today. How can we come together working with state leaders and community leaders to make sure that we absolutely tackle that issue? Uh, you can't get more basic. You can't get more imperative than do people have enough to eat. So that's, that's the topic today. Uh, we wanna make sure that every little boy and every little girl and every mom and dad and grandma and grandpa have adequate nutrition. We can't even begin to talk about trauma-informed care or the correct educational context if kids are going to school or living at home and their belly is rattling from not having enough to eat. We've got a rock star panel and a rock star moderator. So I'm going to go to the rock star moderator who will introduce you to the rock star panel. Matt, take it away. Thanks, Terry, and thank you for that opening and framing. Um, 
as Terry said, access to food has been an increasing topic of concern for Kentucky families and for us advocates across the state, especially for children who receive meals at schools. And we're excited that Kentucky has received final approval um, for the pandemic EBT benefit that has been extended from October to June. And so this round of benefits is gonna be administrated a little bit differently in the past. And so today we have a great group of advocates and partners coming together um, and a state liaison to talk about that with us. So we have Jason Dunn, director of DCPS's Division of Family Support. We have Corinna, Corinna Cash, advocate coordinator um, with Feeding Kentucky. And then we have Karina Barlis, who is the executive director of La Casita Center. So I'm, try, I'm gonna try not to get Corinna and Karina confused throughout this entire um, segment. So um, Jason's gonna actually kick us off with a short presentation and then we're gonna go into a panel discussion. So Jason, can you kind of ground us all in reminding us what PEBT, what's different now in this round? Absolutely. Um, let me uh, go on ahead and start screen sharing here. <clears throat> let me make sure I get the right thing. All right. Can you all see that? It may be coming up still. You see it? Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, um, first of all, um, I want to be lumped in with the partners and not separated as a state liaison. Is that okay? <laughs> that works for me. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, let me get my screens back because, you know, once you start sharing, it's hard to see the screens again. So I want to see people's faces. Um, so the presentation that I have up right now is a, a modified version of what we presented at uh, um, uh, Health and Welfare and Family Services in December on Pandemic EBT and I updated it with the latest information. So I'll skip through a lot of this really fast. Um, so yes, we are on PEBT 3.0 in Kentucky. Uh, we, we started off with last year's, which was pretty fairly easy to administer, but we've had to make changes along the way, of course. Uh, every iteration has been a little bit different. Um, we had a, an application process for the non-SNAP uh, uh, families the first time. Uh, we didn't have an application the second time because we had a very short window to issue benefits and we had to make some tough decisions there. We erred on the side of serving all families. Um, it may have included some families that weren't technically eligible, but we made the, uh, the other option was that eligible, a lot more eligible families would not have received benefits. So um, I, I'll go through a little bit of what PEBT is. I think everybody knows, uh, you know, we're reimbursing meals that kids would have, uh, 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 for meals that kids would have received while they were at school uh, through the National School Lunch Program. Uh, a lot of uh, kids in Kentucky attend schools where there's a high enough percentage of free and reduced lunch, uh, free and reduced meals that uh, the entire student body is eligible. That's called community eligibility provision. Uh, or CEP. So every student in that uh, school is eligible for NSLP, therefore eligible for PEBT reimbursement as well. So um, I think I just summarized all of that. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, this goes through the first phase, <coughs> excuse me, all kids were all virtual all the time, so it wasn't a it, that part wasn't an issue. We just needed to get three hundred and thirteen dollars and fifty cents um, for all three of those months out to all eligible students. Um, that was about one hundred and sixty nine million dollars in benefits that we sent out. Um, then we had the second phase 2.0 that covered August and September. Uh, that was as long as the federal authorization lasted. So. Um, we found that out on August 20th. So as you can imagine, that was a scramble to get those benefits out. We couldn't tie the past PEBT cards to the current. So we issued all new cards to all students. Um, so that was a little bit different than the last time. We didn't have an application process. So everybody got them, whether they wanted them or not, they got them. Um, so then we got, and I'm gonna go through here real quick. Um, I, so, PEBT gets reauthorized 
through the continuing appropriations uh, bill that was passed um, on October 1st. So um, there were uh, simplifying assumptions that we could use uh, to try and determine um, more broad stroke eligibility as far as uh, uh, instructional method. That's what really determines the benefit level is the instructional method. Uh, we could basically, we were able to go at the district level uh, from, from October and beyond rather than the school level that we were trying to do for August and September, which was much more precise and much more confusing, really. Um, we submitted our plan on inauguration day. We were approved 35 days later, 36 days later, sorry. Um, so we have issued the first round of PEBT that, that was for the month of October. Uh, we issued that on, we, we said we would issue it the week of uh, March 15th. We really issued it on Friday night and it was available on Saturday for folks who still had their cards available. And for SNAP families, it was put on their regular uh, EBT card for SNAP. So here, uh, just uh, a little bit about the calculation. The daily rate is $6.82. That's breakfast, lunch, and a snack. Uh, that's the cost for that. That's a national uh, cost, a national average. Um, I'll, this goes into the inside baseball about how we arrived at those days. I won't go into all of that. Uh, but basically, if uh, all virtual students can get 20 days of PEBT per month and hybrid students can receive 12 days worth per month. So 136.40 or 81.84, depending on the predominant schedule of, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the predominant instruction method for the school district. We surveyed all the districts to, to see how their schools uh, lined up. Um, we had one school district that insisted they were all in person, that that was their predominant schedule for all these months. We don't think that's correct. We asked and asked and asked, um, but uh, Green County <laughs> insisted that they were all uh, in person. So we issued zero dollars in <laughs> for that. Uh, I'm sorry, you have a question? Oh, okay. Just an extra noise. Um, so anyway, there is a reconsideration process, and this is for any student that maintained an all virtual schedule while the school was hybrid, or even if they said they were 100% in person. We know there's students that for their health reasons and maybe for health reasons uh, for somebody in the home elected to have an all virtual schedule, even though there were some in person. So we can do some reconsideration in those situations. Um, what we can't do reconsiderations for is if somebody says, well, I really went 15 days, I stayed home 15 days instead of 12 days. We can't do reconsiderations for those situations. That 12 is supposed to represent an average of those. But if your student was going uh, in a completely different schedule than the predominant uh, schedule of the, of the school system, we can do a reconsideration that way. And here's all the information we'll need for that. Like I said, SNAP benefits will, or for SNAP recipients, we're gonna place those on their SNAP EBT card. Um, everybody else will use those cards they had before. If they've lost them or if they threw them away because they thought you know, it wasn't gonna happen again, then they can call us to uh, get those uh, reissued to them. Um, they, we do have some first timers. Uh, so you know, kids coming into preschool or kindergarten, uh, people moving into the state, they'll be issued a new card as well. That's about 15,000 cards, and they won't be mailed until the 25th. We thought they were going to be mailed earlier. We don't, uh, we're not happy with our EBT vendor for this, but we're, they're going to be um, mailed out in about a week. So the new folks will see theirs a little bit later than everyone else. Um, so here's the schedule, um, the, the plan. Uh, we, we didn't want to issue um, almost $320 million all at once uh, and put that into the uh, system and overload everybody. So we had to come up with a way to stagger the issuance. Um, and the way we decided to do that was to issue the, the month pure amounts every, each week until we're all caught up. Um, that way, everybody gets something every week instead of trying to you know, say who's going to get there sooner than later. 
Um, so that was our way of staggering. We'll be all caught up about the middle of April. We'll have the February benefits out. And then after that, we'll do a new file each month and we'll be issuing that on the 25th of the month until that's complete. The 25th is in that um, space where SNAP isn't being issued. So it's not, uh, there's not an overload uh, of benefits that way. We think all told, we are approved for about $590 million for the entire school year. This is just through February. Um, that amount may go down uh, as schools start to go back. So as we, you know, we will pull, uh, you know, each month and see what that predominant schedule is. And as you see students are going back, that amount may decrease. Um, any other issues? Uh, this has been a big one. The first one, uh, non-CEP schools depends on individual student eligibility. And if uh, a lot of schools haven't been capturing that NSLP eligibility because they've been able to operate under a different program uh, through the school year. So um, if a student hasn't filled out that NSLP form yet to determine that eligibility, uh, they can do that and do that through their school soon. So uh, when we run the file again with uh, Kentucky Department of Education, we'll, we'll pick them up and their eligibility will go back to October 1st. So um, anytime during the school year, if someone is determined eligible, we'll pick them up and, and, uh, and go back to October. My uh, guess is that we'll have a, uh, a cleanup uh, to capture uh, a lot of those two that uh, maybe we didn't pick them up correctly on the file. I'm, I'm sure we'll have some cleanup to do. Um, we maintained all of our, just some, uh, uh, administrative issues. We did maintain the, the number of DCBS staff uh, on the dedicated to PEBT on our phone line and then we also added over 30 and I don't know what the number is but it's over 30 um, call agents through one of our uh, uh, call services contract providers to handle some of the higher volume issues. So um, we think we're pretty well staffed. We know that our staff um, they don't deal with PEBT regularly. So uh, sometimes we have to issue instructions a couple of times and remind people what the rules are. So if you've heard people giving different answers, we're trying to clean all that up. Um, it happens each time. Um, and and uh, unfortunately it's a part of having a, a quick program that's not, you know, that's not uh, gonna be lasting very long. It's, it's harder to get instructional material out. Um, and along the way, we've held stakeholder meetings uh, with advocates like KYA. Uh, we've included Frisky, school nutrition directors, directors of pupil personnel, uh, immigrant serving populations. Uh, thank you, Karina, uh, to, uh, and, and, uh, um, and LEP populations, just so we can make sure everybody's on the same page and we're providing consistent messages across the board. Uh, you know, families don't come to our social media to find out their PEBT stuff or especially any school related stuff. They go to school websites, they go to school uh, Facebook pages, they talk to each other on Facebook groups and we wanna make sure we, we, uh, we can get a, a good consistent message out. It's a challenge, but I, I hope by the third time we're doing a little bit better with that, but you never, you never know, there's always issues. Um, the last thing is just uh, really basic stuff about PEBT. Um, we do cover uh, not just public schools, but schools on military bases and some private schools that participate in the National School Lunch Program as well. Um, not homeschooled students. We can't, we can't serve them. Um, same types of foods as SNAP. And, you know, I always want to remind people it's 100% federally funded. Even the administrative effort this time is 100% federally funded. It was 50-50 before, but now that's, that's how we can hire 30 plus uh, agents to, <laughs> to be on the phone uh, through 100% uh, administrative funding uh, from the feds. Um, so they don't even flow to the state at all until someone makes a purchase with that card. So, you know, if somebody gets a PEBT card and, and they decide they don't want it and they destroy the card, the money never gets spent. 
So uh, I want to make sure that's clear. We wanted to make sure that was clear to our legislators as well. Um, and they understand that now. So um, um, there is also an opt out uh, provision that uh, if a family just does not want to get issued the card at all, if they don't want to have that issued in their student's name, we're going to have that built into the system. That's going to be built the same time that people can ask re for reconsideration. That is also going to be available too. So, you know, if people really, really, really don't want it, they can call us and let us know. Um, that's about it. Um, I, I wanted to make sure our phone number was on there. There is a PEBT option on that uh, line. There is a uh, line for folks with limited English proficiency. If they need uh, translator services, um, they can access those there too. And then I put links to our uh, PEBT FAQ document that answers almost everything I just said. And uh, there is a Spanish version of that as well on our website. So um, I don't know if I stayed within my five to seven minute window, but uh, <laughs> that's all I have for now and happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Jason. I think this is a helpful overview of what's been happening and what's going on. I know there was a wealth of information and several things that have changed this round. So right. I think it was helpful to ground us all in that important information. Um, also, I would add, and I hope um, that this magically appears in the chat, we also have a breakdown of what's um, what's occurring this round of PBT that we put in our blog. So hopefully that appears shortly in a second. And then also Jason's happy um, to share these slides. So we'll put it in our recap as well. So everyone can um, have access to this important information as well. Um, so let's just dive into our panel discussion now. And I'll um, have Karina uh, kick us off um, and talk about really what have you heard in in the Latinx community. I know there was a lot of discussion around cultural awareness, confusion on the benefit, um, disparities that also impact, um, you know, Latinx community actually utilizing these benefits. So can you talk more about what's going on? Absolutely. Buenos dias and good morning to everybody. So happy to be uh, in this amazing group of people with one of my very favorite Kentucky Youth Advocates. I love you so much. Thank you for inviting me. And, and with my new best friend, Jason. You are my new best friend. Thank you. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you. <laughs> So let me share my screen and let me tell you a little bit of what the story is of, of, of the information that uh, I would like to share. You know, something that we have been advocating for years is that whenever, you know, any kind of information is being put out there, any kind of data, any kind of research, any kind of numbers, you know, I'm, I'm usually wondering, are those numbers, are, is that data, is that information that is accessible? Because even, you know, for us as La Casita, uh, and, and for us being a very unique, you know, in the state, for us to being advocating everywhere, and we don't, we nobody has ever asked me as a Latina, uh, nobody has ever surveyed me, nobody has ever surveyed or asked any one of uh, over 21 staff that are also from the Latinx community. So I'm always wondering, you know, what is it? Is it real that people are getting out there, all the information? So one of the best practices that we do at La Casita, we like to listen to the community. We are a Latinx-led, feminist-led organization. And what that means for us is that every single one of the accompaniments that we uh, provide to the community, it is not that we come and we say, oh, hello, uh, this is what you need. We always ask. So for us, listening to the community has been very important and necessary in order for any program or any uh, initiative is successful within our community. So what did we do with the PEBT? Uh, we wanted to know if in reality if people uh, understood or knew how to access the PEBT. You know, we have some of our uh, staff members that are parents of children in, in JCPS and they were very confused, just like everybody in the community. So what we did, we created 
a survey. We conducted in two kinds of surveys. One was on, on social media, on a social media post, and the other one with every person that will call uh, a La Casita in, in two weeks, we asked several questions that let us you know, understand what, what was the knowledge of the community. And so we could come back to you all and say, this is what we heard from the community. This is what the community is telling us. The reason why we just didn't keep it on social media is because we have to remember that uh, having access to social media, to internet and to websites is a privilege for most of the Latinx community. A lot of people don't read and write in any language. A lot of people speak Spanish as their second language. So we wanted to capture those voices and those are the voices that I'm always you know, telling people, how do you know that that is what is really happening if people that don't read or write didn't fill out your survey. So um, through the uh, social media, uh, we, you know, we ask, uh, you know, the questions, do you know what it is? Uh, yes, uh, uh, or not, or yes, but I don't know how to apply or how to get it. Some of the, the issues that we found out uh, with the previous PEBT is that uh, uh, people, you know, never got their card. Maybe the school sent text or messages or emails, but they didn't have access to any of those. And believe it or not, there are so many people in our community that uh, don't even know their phone number. Uh, that might sound like, like how in the world they don't know, but a lot of people don't know their phone number. So even if they provided it to the school, might not be the number where they are receiving text. And if they receive a text, they don't know how to open that take so um that that's on that so what else did we do you know our amazing community liaisons uh con conducted you know through the phone and the first thing is we wanted to know, are they aware? You know, so we were asking, do you know uh, about PBT? Do you know what that means? Um, and then we ask, you know, do you know how was the process, how you get it? And then we also ask, well, you know, what's the what's the barrier? And a lot of people were confused between PVT and food food stamps. So so that that was some of the barriers and the confusions that that we saw in those phone conversations. So our results in general were. Uh, a, the survey in, in total, we had a total of 94 responses on phone and media. And, and uh, we can see, you know, that uh, 46 out of the 94 didn't know what PEBT is. And 38 did know what PEBT is. That's on the whole overall uh, two weeks of survey that, that uh, we did on phone and social media. And then, you know, on the phone, uh, when we were asking the questions, you know, do you know what PEBT is? 25 say yes, 19 say no. Uh, have you applied for PEBT? 21 say yes, 13 say no, one, I don't know. And some of the concerns we heard is that they don't, they are not sure what it is again, you know, is this food the food stamps? And if it's food stamps, is it going to affect my public charge? Or is it going to affect my immigration status? Because we have to remember that for the immigrant and refugee communities in general, the, uh, and especially with, with uh, the previous administration, the fear or just being uh, coming forward and, and even looking for COVID uh, related support, even if they are sick, it was something absolutely very terrifying because you know the threats and, and, the, uh, uh, and the fear is, is actually uh, real for us. So that's that's where we found out with with our survey. So what are we doing right now? Uh, you know, through the collaboration with KYA, uh, we are trying, you know, not only to get the amazing information that we're getting from Jason's, Jason's team. Jason, I have never seen uh, something so clear, uh, all the process, our community liaison were so happy when we got all the information in Spanish, so, so clear and it's so fluid and, you know, it's very easy for us to grasp and for us to explain. We are also, you know, using 
our, our trusted Spanish media, our social media, as well as our uh, weekly show to talk to the, to the community about what this is. So that, that's coming up uh, uh, soon. And we are also you know, sharing this information with our siblings organizations. And I, and I send them a big, a big hello to all of them, like Adelante, Backside, uh, Doors to Hope, Americana, uh, KRM, Catholic Charities, that do an amazing, amazing job in also passing on the information. So we are trying to use as many strategies as possible so all the families can benefit and our students can benefit with this. So what are the next steps is for us to, uh, I think that focus on this silver lining in, in this pandemic that we have learned to really find different ways of making information available to the community. One of the silver linings for us as an organization is that we have uh, officially and, and structurally started consulting services for any organization out there that really needs to reach out to the Latinx community because you know it, it really takes beyond a website and a brochure. It is about understanding what is the suffering, the barriers and the fear of the community. So that's what I wanted to share with you today, what we are hearing from the community right now. I know it's a survey that we only took in two weeks and I know that there are so many answers that we need to collect out there, but um, you know, I am very hopeful that this is the first step. Thank you for that. And you are a true KYA or by surveying and digging into the data first <laughs> before going ahead and determining outreach strategies. That's awesome. And we're excited to hear and see that roll out. Um, that's, that's valuable information. I mean, just hearing that the community hasn't heard of PBT and what that is that is something that we as a cold, like as a group here today and as advocates could certainly do better is, is putting out those messages. Um, so Corinna, can you tell us more about the concerns you've heard within the communities and how those, how these new changes have impacted um, what the, your next strategies and uh, um, next strategies and next steps are? Yeah, definitely. I will say the Corinna Karina confused me a little bit. I had to sit there for a second and be like, which one? <laughs> um, but hi, my name is Corinna Cash. I'm the advocacy coordinator Feeding Kentucky, as Mahek mentioned earlier. Um, I think the changes with PBT and really just the communication changes have been huge. I think a lot of the confusion that we heard in the last round was just people were getting cards in the mail. I don't know where they didn't know what the cards were for. They didn't know the process. They didn't know who to call. So really just the communication that the cabinet and Jason and his team has done to make sure stakeholders and school nutrition directors um, and different communities are on board with PBT and have the information they need um, and have the correct information out there. I know on a lot of channel, there's a lot of misinformation, especially in Facebook groups where misinformation tends to thrive. Um, so just the work they've done to get everybody on the same board has been incredibly helpful. The way they've partnered with us um, and the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy and Kentucky Voices for Health has been incredible. Um, I think the biggest outreach strategy for us is schools. We've worked really, really closely with the Kentucky School Nutrition Association uh, because by and large, that's where people are going to get their information. Um, not everybody has access to social media. One of the biggest topics we talked about this legislative session has been broadband. The fact that a lot of Kentucky kids rely on places like McDonald's or the library to do homework. Um, so not everyone's on social media and that message on social media can only go so far. And schools are really the most effective place to dispel that information. It's a place where parents largely trust. It's a place where parents will go to get that information. Um, so really making sure they have all the tools necessary has been the biggest key to our outreach strategy. That's great to hear. Um, so to anyone really that's on the panel here, I want to ask, um, what do advocates need to know about the rollout and what are some potential speed bumps? I think it's always um, great to be transparent and share what, what are some potential roadblocks? So, you know, I, I think that that um, having a, a clear understanding on how all of all of the you know not only PVT but other services how they work and and also for us to be able to reach out uh, directly uh, to see to say you know. Um, 
these are the barriers that we have found. How can we fix them together? You know, in the past, uh, you know, there were, we would call, we would try to reach out and there was not res a response. That's why I was really praising Jason's team because this is the first time that, that I have seen in my 21 years of, of work that, you know, there is this openness for us to reach out and say, you know, the community is suffering. Uh, we as advocates, we as, as service providers encounter bear all these barriers, hence the barriers that our communities are facing, you know, are larger than ours. So, so uh, trying to understand the process, having a person or people or a team that we can reach out and bring the concerns, you know, and, and do the very same thing that it was done at this time to be sitting at the table from the beginning, not only when the system finds a barrier, but from the beginning. So uh, we can include best practices and, and easy navigation uh, tools for, for the community from the beginning, not in the middle, not at the end. Corinna, do you have anything to add no. for Jason? Sorry, we were so happy to have that conversation. It was really Mahek that got that ball rolling at our initial uh, um, uh, stakeholder meeting. So uh, uh, Mahek provided us with a couple of contacts and I got, uh, I know a lot of you may know Miranda Brown with Kentucky Equal Justice Center. She gave me a ton of extra contacts and I, I couldn't write them down fast enough. So, um, you know, I hope we got, uh, half of the people that we uh, that uh, that she provided names for so that was a such a great conversation and we were thrilled to be able to not just translate our FAQ that we have here but our entire uh, media guide uh, for PEBT we translated that whole packet into uh, uh, Spanish resources as well so that's been uh, a good effort a good collaborative effort thank you all Thanks, Jason. And just to add, um, I think the biggest thing advocates can do is just be informed with the right information about PBT and talk to families. Like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of families on social media who might not see the PBT information for social media. Um, and the amount of families who call me and say they heard about it from like their cousin's sister or like these family or friend connections. I think by far the vast majority of people aren't learning through things like Facebook and Instagram. They're learning through a friend of a friend who told them. So making sure you have the right information and you have these conversations with the parents you know in your life um, is really crucial. Yeah, um, so that kind of lends to how, how do we equip uh, Army and advocates to troubleshoot any issues that our families are seeing, you know, especially if they're hearing it from a friend of a friend or social media or any other platform, whatever it might be. You know, that's a, that's a great uh, question, Mahek. I would really, um, something that, that, that we have encountered is uh, maybe, you know, us as La Casita could, you know, navigate, understand we have the beautiful connection uh, with you all and, and we are navigating through it together. But I also, I think it would be a good idea, just the same way that we did the survey for the families to have the, a, a survey for organizations, because, you know, also uh, our black siblings, they have a lot, I'm pretty sure, you know, there are so many barriers out there for, for them. So, you know, to ask the organizations, black and brown uh, led organizations, what are their barriers and how can uh, they, uh, you know, be equipped to answer you know, the questions, but learning from them first, because we can make a lot of assumptions. I can make the assumptions based on, on what we uh, see on a daily basis, but that wouldn't be fair. I would really uh, ask them directly. And I think that that could be part of, of the best tools that we can provide for the, for the next adventures that are coming in the future. Others? It's okay if you don't have an answer. <laughs> um, so what can advocates on this forum do to help get the word out since that seems to be one of the biggest takeaways I'm hearing? Yeah, 
Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, I mean, just learn about PBT and what resources are available with it and also where to direct people for resources. Uh, I know we have information on our website, Kentucky Voices for Health and the Homeless and Housing Coalition do, Kentucky Center for Environmental Policy, Kentucky Justice Center do, KYA does. Um, I'm sure a lot of Casita Center has information on their website as well um, and have trusted places you can direct them to with good information about what PBT looks like um, and have those conversations. Sharing on social media, while it won't reach everyone, it is really, really effective. Also, if you have any friends in the school system, ask them to share. I know having the school nutrition director share has been a huge, huge help, and it's really gotten the message out to the families that they feed. Um, and yeah, I just keep having those conversations. Like, that's really the biggest thing. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that most uh, um, well, probably about half of the folks receiving PEBT don't normally intersect with um, the public assistance arena. So, you know, they may not understand a lot about, you know, how to use the benefit, how to, how to activate the card. You know, we put all the instructions in there, but it still can be confusing, I know. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's working a lot with families who, who may not have any frame of reference for how to use these benefits or what they mean. So, um, you know, even even to folks that are like, why am I getting this card? My kids don't receive, well, you know, they do probably do receive free and reduced lunch, but they don't see themselves that way. And, uh, um, you know, for them, it may be uh, more, uh, we, we try to use the word stimulus as much as we can when we talk about PEBT. Um, you know, to not think of it as an assistance benefit, but it's a reimbursement. I mean, it really is a reimbursement because you're paying for meals that would normally have been covered by your child's school. So it's a reimbursement. Please, um, please spend these federal dollars in Kentucky. <laughs> you know, we don't want to, uh, uh, we don't want to turn anything back if we don't have to, you know, these, these are benefits that, uh, um, or it's funding or it's stimulus, however you want to call it. I try to stay away from the word benefits even, um, you know, but it's money that circulates through our economy and it helps the entire food chain from farmers to the grocery checkout person uh, and everybody in between. So um, they circulate through our community and they make our community stronger. So um, it, there, there may be some discussions that you need to have with folks in that direction too, so. Jason, can you um, share some other lessons that you've learned throughout this process? I think that might be helpful. I mean, I think you just alluded to one with it, which is messaging and calling it a stimulus. Right, right. Yeah, we, we learned that um, probably the second round uh, <laughs> that it was important. Um, well, because we had a we had an application process in that first round. Um, so, you know, it was it served fewer families than it could have. You know, we probably um, we probably had about a hundred thousand or so students that did not uh, whose parents did not apply for the benefit. Um, we did the automatic issuance to all students in the second round out of necessity, um, just because we had no time to to uh, we only had a month to get those out. We didn't have time to stand up an application process again. Um, and that was an important lesson for us too. Um, yes, part of it was messaging and people not knowing what they were getting and being mad about getting it. Um, I, I think my phrase in that, <laughs> in, during that time was uh, the only thing worse than not getting benefits out to people who are poor is uh, accidentally getting benefits to people who aren't poor. Um, that was a, a stronger pushback than I could have imagined. So we tried to balance that uh, in this third round by, again, not having an application process and doing automatic issuance, but also providing that opt-out option um, for the folks who, who don't want it or don't think they need it and, you know. So those were important and of course, staffing uh, was a big issue too. Um, you know, we were trying to, in the first and second rounds, we had to work within the staff that we had, um, and it and it was hard to pull people off of regular casework duty to talk about PEBT. Um, my staff 
here in Frankfurt were trying to handle everything and that was a lot uh, for them to handle by themselves. And I kept telling them that. And then we had the blessing of the 100% uh, administrative funding for this round. So, you know, I think that will help resolve some of those uh, backlog issues and, and overworking issues <laughs> for some of my staff, frankly. Um, so I think those were the biggest issues that we found. And, and of course, making sure we involve more and more stakeholders uh, in the process. You know, I learned a long time ago that people don't listen to government communications as much as we like to think they do. Um, they don't, and they like hearing from trusted voices. Uh, um, they're they're, they're going to go to their trusted voices, uh, whether that's KVH, from KVH to KYA to Feeding Kentucky, all the all those people that Karen I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, people are going to go to the uh, the folks they know and they're they're going to listen to them. So I think that's um, and especially their schools. Uh, I think that's probably the the biggest probably the biggest uh, disparity uh, that we saw in the stories about how to access PEBT and, and what it is and everything. Every school had a little bit something different <laughs> on their on their Facebook pages and on their web pages. So I, I hope that we've uh, at least tried to uh, bridge that gap as much as we could. Thank you for that. Um, so going back to, I didn't know if Corinna or Karina had anything else to add on um, just resources out there or what advocates could do other than just following social media, looking at our blog posts, following certain groups. Um, just wanted to circle back to make sure there wasn't anything else that you wanted to chime in and add. Yeah, so I will say the cabinet has a, an awesome um, resource guide for how to talk to media about PBT, graphics to share. Um, Feeding Kentucky and the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy, also at the end of this week, we'll be releasing a small toolkit with some additional graphics, sample tweets, social media posts, outreach information. Um, I believe that'll come out around Friday, beginning of next week. Um, and yeah, those are two awesome resources. Also, KY has an awesome blog on it. Thank you. I would also say, you know, if there is anybody here that doesn't, um, that their organization is not in Louisville uh, and that maybe you have an immigrant a refugee led organization or that serves immigrants and refugees in your community and they don't know what to do, they don't know how to reach out, they want ideas, please reach out to us. Um, La Casita loves to share, you know, our best practices because, you know, when, when we all uh, have knowledge and we are all empowered, all whole state, you know, grows uh, together uh, in, in, in unity. So please uh, send them our way. And also, you know, if uh, at any moment, you know, we, you work with those organizations, uh, it is very important that they are also at the table from the beginning. The other, I wanted just to piggyback a little bit with with uh, the the uh, comment on J on the the school districts. It is also very important for us to continue inviting and encouraging our our school districts uh, to be aware of uh, the privilege and the lack of privilege that a lot of our students have. Uh, sometimes, you know, just like Jason uh, comment, you know, there are different in information everywhere. And most of the information that is being shared is not culturally appropriate or uh, inclusive for anyone of the communities that have been minoritized. You know, brown, brown and, and black communities, we are always having that barrier because somebody's putting out there the, the message for us, not us putting the message for our community. So it is very important that, that you know, that we start, uh, you know, changing the way that, that we are doing things. So in that way, in reality, we are being inclusive. Sitting at the table working as a team, I, I have found is the best way of, of being stronger as a community. That was beautifully said. Um, I'm gonna end with one final question to all of you. I think um, what PBT has highlighted during this pandemic is the need for strong school nutrition policy. And so I just wanted to ask um, the panelists here if 
you know, what's the future of school nutrition policy? And if you guys have suggestions or how do we move forward? Yeah, I would love to talk about this. So actually in the U.S. Senate right now, they're starting the process for something called child nutrition reauthorization, which is this big ominous bill that includes all the child nutrition policies. One thing we're really pushing for in that child nutrition reauthorization is summer EBT. Summer EBT is a program, it's been a demonstration test for the last 10 years, but it's $5,200 um, to existing SNAP cases during the summer to compensate for the lack of school meals. Um, in Oregon, it cut food insecurity by like a third or a half. Like it's a massively important tool, especially in rural communities where transportation is a huge issue and not everybody can reach those summer food sites. Right. So we're really looking to that child nutrition authorization. We would love to see school meal strengthen. Um, also, Jason mentioned that community eligibility provision. We would love to see that lowered. Right now, 40% of students in a school have to qualify for free and reduced meals to be considered community eligible. We would love to see that lowered so that more Kentucky schools where they do have high rates of children receiving free and reduced meals can access those. Um, right now, less than 100 Kentucky schools qualify or don't qualify for CEP. That threshold was lowered to 33%. Pretty much every Kentucky school would qualify for free and reduced meals universally. Um, which also gets into this really exciting conversation that a lot of states are having around universal school meals. Should we be charging kids to eat in school? Um, that's a conversation I know Feeding Kentucky's had internally and we would love to have with anybody and everyone interested. Um, and then finally, not necessarily on the school meals front, but I think it's a really important conversation around SNAP. There's a lot of families who have really, really benefited from PBT and that probably qualify for SNAP. So at what point do we encourage those families to apply for SNAP? Um, SNAP is and always has been the first line of defense against food insecurity. For every one meal that we can feed at a food bank, SNAP can feed nine. Um, so it's massively important. Um, and we were really excited in the American Rescue Plan that that 15% increase in SNAP was included and we'd love to see it made permanent. And yeah, that's where I'll end on what's next. Yeah, I'm excited about those conversations, uh, Karen. I've, I've I've seen, you know, some of the headlines of it. I haven't uh, been able to dive in to, to the nitty gritty yet, but they all, you know, they sound like very positive steps that uh, hopefully we'll be taking. And, you know, we've been issuing, um, just in hunger in general, when we talk about SNAP, we've been issuing maximum benefits for a year now. Um, we're gonna issue April. Uh, we're gonna issue maximum benefits again in April. And, you know, that's an extra, you know, somewhere between 35 and $43 million a month in SNAP benefits. Um, and, you know, even with maximum benefits, even with PEBT, there's still families out there, you know, that say, you know, when is this coming? When is, when is PEBT coming? When is this round going to come? You know, they're, um, there's still, you know, there's still a great need out there. So even with all the additional benefits we've been able to, and, and frankly, you know, I think the federal government should look at that and say, you know, if that's the case, then maybe this thrifty food plan that we're doing isn't, uh, isn't meeting people's needs. And, and maybe hopefully they'll take a look at that. I don't know. But uh, uh, it's, it's been great to be able to provide those extra resources uh, in the last year. And I really think that, that um, this is a good lesson for all of us, uh, you know, as, as a collective, uh, you know, when Terry started at the beginning saying, you know, 22% of, of, you know, families are in, are hungry in our state, you know, it's, it's very important for us to, to look at how we, um, approach the accessibility of benefits. Sometimes, you know, it has been like, like people have to struggle so much to get, you know, food stamps or to go to uh, food pantries or, or soup kitchens. You know, like it, it feels, a, it feels to me that, that sometimes it is not done honoring the dignity of people. So how do we change that you know the way that that we see it is not like uh oh my gosh how in the world you don't have food but how can we support you for you to feed your family without it to be punitive or denigrating to be done in a way that this is this is how the community shares with you you can share 
once your, your situation is better. Thank you for that. You just alluded to how food is just a basic need um, that we all need to have ac adequate access to throughout, not only throughout school period, but also throughout the rest of the day, um, through among as a family as well. So thank you for just elevating and reminding us all, even those basic things that we just don't consider every day. Um, so thank you to our panelists. I just wanted to say um, this was a wealth of information and an important topic that we just discussed here. And we know that information is going to be shared um, with everyone that has been has attended through our email recap. Um, also, we want to thank Aetna Better Health for their support of today's advocate forum. And as we look ahead to next week's forum, we are gonna um, talk about Child Abuse Prevention Month. So join us as we discuss um, ways to strengthen families to prevent child abuse and neglect. Um, and so we'll have an amazing panel of folks joining us to talk about that as well. And as always, we'll send a recording of this Advocate Virtual Forum along with the resources discussed and a link to sign up for next week. So thanks again for joining us. We truly appreciate all of you all. Bye. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Everyone. Bye. Thanks, y'all. Adios.